questions that you bring to us through the pen of inspiration. We pray that you may awaken our hearts, that we may see the urgency of the matter, and Lord, to heed and flee for our lives. We pray, Lord, that you may walk with us, that you may quicken our hearts, our minds, and Lord, we may take hold of your hand like Lord did by the angels and was saved from destruction. In Jesus' name we pray. I, I like the presentation that I've just gone by. There's one thing that he said about bulls that plow. That the bulls that plow are very humble. And I, I, I concur 100% on that because I, I did plow with bulls when I was young. That was my work. And I remember we had one of the most powerful bulls in the area. Very strong. When we, we go, you know, when schools open, we were allowed to take our cows to the school to cut the grass. You know, instead of cutting the grass with the fungus, we bring the cows to, to clean up the grass. And, and our bull, no bull could challenge that bull. But it was the bull that I put for, and I was a small boy like my son. And I put hold it, I could stroke its, its head and put it in the yolk. But it was very strong, and yet it was very humble because it was a bull that used to work. But when we don't serve with the Lord, we are very rough and very proud. So that was a very good lesson. Another thing, that, another thing I'd like to uh, add on what was spoken in the previous session was the common statement that we read that, that Abraham believed God and it was counted on him for righteousness. Do we really know what that statement means? What is it that was comprised of Abraham believing in God? What is it that made God say that Abraham believed on him and therefore it was counted on him for righteousness? What was it really? You know, many times we, we are what we call surface readers. We read the word of God on the surface. And we have our preconceived notion about it. And so when you see, oh, that statement, I've seen it before. Oh, I think I know about it. You have no idea what it meant for it to be written that Abraham believed in God. You have no idea. When we read Hebrews chapter 11, let's look at Hebrews chapter 11. I, I, I thought I knew the Bible. I, I, have no, I don't know the Bible. I have come to discover I'm just a very young student in the Bible. We, have, we don't know the Bible a thing. You know what is inspired? God is very careful in the selection of words that were written in his word. And every word has a meaning. There was a reason why everything was written. Hebrews chapter 11. And I want us to look at the section for Moses. It's verse 24. You know, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ to greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Esteeming the reproach of Christ. Esteeming the reproach. He thought very highly of the reproach of Christ. Today we don't like to be seen in a negative light. We don't want to be called offshoots and weird people. We don't like that. We'd like to do something that, that commends us to our brethren, to the world. We'd like to be comfortable. We'd like to be neutral. We don't want to rock the boat. When you look at the giants of faith, they did things that were odd. They were despised. 
rejected of men. When you hear that Abraham believed in God, what does it actually mean? It meant everything for Abraham. It meant him leaving his home, his ancestral home. That is what it meant that he believed in God. He believed that what God has said is true. Whether he can see the end in sight or not, he will do it because God has done what? That is what it means belief. Believing is not an intellectual assent to an idea. Oh, okay, I agree. No, that is not belief. Belief means you are doing something, you are taking an action out of a message that, you, that has come to you and that people cannot quite understand because faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. So when you hear Abraham believed, it is deep. It meant him leaving his country home. And God didn't give him an address of his destination. Didn't tell him it's a part of his place. And all his days he lived in a tent, not in a mansion. That is what it means he believed. Believing can only be possible when there is an action. If there is no action, it is an intellectual pastime. And we have many of them in your schools. Many intellectual pastimes. You learn of theorems, concepts, you never even come across. It's a waste of time. When you believe something, people can know it from far. They can know it from far. So when you hear that statement, Abraham believed in, in God, think again, it is not just intellectual. He believed and so he, God said, go and he went. God told him, go and offer your only son. God stressed that point, he is your only son. Go and offer him for a sacrifice. And the following day, Abraham got up and he went. That is what it means, believe. To believe in something is to take an action promptly, not delayed, not guarded. No, it is God who has said it, I am going. How many of you guys were here last April when I gave the presentation on country living? Okay. The hands are a bit fewer. They are a bit feeble. They are struggling to go up. I know why, you know what I'm going to <laughs> For the sake of those who are not here, I will go over again on that. I know we are struggling with this. How many have met the decision of those that were here? That because God has said it, we are going to the country. How many? The challenge. Abraham believed in God, and it was counted for him for what? Right. And this is my hope, that at the end of this week, once God has brought the truth forth, if indeed it is for God, then I would like you to take a step of faith. This is my prayer, and there is nothing I'm going to tell you from my head. Everything I will show you here is as that says the Lord, either from the Bible or from the pen of inspiration. It is dangerous for me to come and tell you something that I think or I know. Because this is a very sensitive issue. Because when you leave, when you make those decisions, they have far-reaching consequences. And I don't want to be to blame. Oh, you know, because Burichara came here and told us this, now you see where we have landed. Ah. In all my presentations, they are extremely sensitive. And they have very, very far-reaching consequences for you and your family. So I want you to make the decision because it is the word of God. But more importantly, I want you <coughs> to make that decision because God has said it. So when I, when I hear presenters coming, they are very weighty statements they make. And I wonder, pastors, do we really know? 
what they mean. Because their statements you have heard before, they have been like the songs we sing here until they are very mechanical. And yet those songs have a message, a very weighty message. It took very long for me to come to know that the hymn that we have today, my brother this morning called us with, uh, no, this morning or last night, that they are Catholic hymnals. <laughs> because I never used to read the content of the SDA hymn. I just used to sing it. Because you see the title of the book, SDA hymn, so you think that's what it is. <laughs> and then I, I came across a patient and I looked slowly and said, ah, oh, they are Catholic words here. They are Catholic this and that. Let me like Mary. Have you guys seen that statement? Yeah, and we used to sing it so many times. You never ask yourself why. That's why when Christ said, Let him who have ears, yeah. God has given us eyes, ears, and brain. Let us make use of them. Let's not be very mechanical. Let us examine the weight of evidence and let us take action. Country living is a very sensitive topic, a topic that most of the established leadership are making fun of. It's very sad. It's very sad because time is running out and we have been told to get out. Why do we need to leave the city? Why do we need to leave the city? It's the question that I would like to ask. Why should we even have these discussions? about leaving the city. Well, look at it in three parts. Why do we have this kind of session? Even me a session every day for country living and you must ask yourself why? Why should we have these sessions? And then why is the secondary reason why we should leave the cities and is the primary reason reason. I want to alert you that my my presentation will not last one hour. One hour might be a bit short. It might be about one hour and a half because I have fifty four slides. I want us to read, because I know after this we don't read, especially if you are on social media, you can't read. How many are on social media? <laughs> Again, the hands are struggling to go up. How many are on social media? <laughs> it is a challenge, ladies and brothers and sisters. I know that there are some good signs of social media, but social media discourages you from reading. So be slow on that. Be slow on it. And spend more time looking at the face of Jesus Amen. instead of Facebook. All right. So I want us to read. I'll take you through a reading expedition this afternoon because these are the words of inspiration, not mine. All right. Again and again, the Lord has instructed that our people are to take their families away from from the cities into the country where they can raise their own provisions for in the future. The problem of buying and selling will be a very serious one. Please remind me to show you a picture about this position towards the end of my presentation. Again and again. This was the message that the prophet was shown again and again. So it is a very serious message, you know, that the problem of buying and selling in the future will be a serious one. And many of you guys think that because you can go to Rogo Town and buy something from the shop, so you wonder, what, what, but there's no problem, I can give it, buy and sell. So you think that it is not a problem. But if I had time, if I had another session today, I will tell you that it is the most dangerous thing to go and buy food in the market. It is the most dangerous thing. In fact, nowadays, when I need, when I, when I am, the food is placed in front of me and say, and then we say, let us pray. That prayer for me, it is more serious than before. I don't know if you understand what I'm talking about. Praying for food has never been more important now than before. It is the most dangerous thing to buy food today. And so the prophet was very serious when he says that the problem of buying and selling will be what? A serious one. If God abhors one sin above another of which his people are guilty of, it's doing nothing in case of an emergency. 
Indifference and neutrality in a, in a religious crisis is regarded of God as a grievous crime and equal to the very worst type of hostility against God. Many of us are indifferent when there is a crisis. We are indifferent. We don't even have a, an opinion about an issue that is of a religious problem. We are not even bothered that a speaker came, was invited by a church in Kisi, and he was turned away by the conference leaders. Nobody is bothered. I mean, that is a sign right there. It is time to flee, brothers and sisters. You are still in Jerusalem. You can't see the sign of what? Abomination standing where? In the holy. Where, since when does a conference official decide when the people of God should be preached to and when they should not be preached to? Since when? I mean, don't you find that odd? This is a pastor who has been preaching in New Life, he has preached in Lovington Church, he has preached in Nairobi Central Church, but this time, one individual decides, uh-huh, I think this time pack up and go. He's a pastor of the church. Why would somebody stop another person from delivering the message of God? And we are indifferent. Oh, it's not, it's not in my church. It's, that is a sign right there. It is time for us to be indifferent. You cannot be indifferent to this issue. It is equivalent to the worst type of hostility against God. Woe unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pastor, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people, ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doing, says the Lord. It's here in the Bible. What happened in Kisi Church is here. They don't want to feed the flock. They want to feed themselves. And we gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries we have driven them, and I will bring them again to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed. Neither shall they be lacking, say the Lord. Are you ready to be one of those shepherds? Who can go and feed the flock? And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus says the Lord God unto the shepherd. Woe to the shepherd of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? And they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. And when he called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against and clean spirits and cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And these twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any of the city of the Samaritans. Enter ye not, but go into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The lost sheep of the house of Israel are the members in our Seventh-day Adventist church. Those are the people we need to go for. Because those people have been grounded on the truth, but they need to be shown the present truth. So that those will now go out and preach to others. We need to go to the lost house of Israel. You know that thing about giving them power against unclean spirits? I witnessed that for the first time. I think it was last week, or last week, but the last week or the other week. In the last town meeting I was in Malindi. You guys have no idea the work that needs to be done out there. You know we were having this town meeting. I was with uh, Michael Ombo. Many know Michael Ombo. Uh, we were doing a meeting with him in a place called Majarazini. And um, we were Julius. Julius was there also. And so we were invited on one of the days. So there was a lady, an old lady who came. She wanted to be prayed for. This is where they are talking about their demons. I said, what is this talk about demons? You know, because I'd never encountered one. So, so now she came to the meeting and she wanted to be prayed for. And I looked at her and she just looked a normal old lady. And so we told her, okay, put her into one of the classrooms. And so Wambua briefed us, you know, this thing, you need to pray because I have seen it before. If you are not right with God, it will be tough. So he briefed us and my wife is there, she got scared to be, you know. <laughs> I, I, I think you just go 
my head. <laughs> I mean, all right, so I was one of the speakers, so I could not excuse myself. So let us go and pray for this place. But I'm telling you, these are things you're going to meet. And so we went to this room, and the lady was seated there, very calm, and uh, her daughter in law was around. Her son, the heir of the church, but uh, he was not in that place. So she sat there, I was with Wambu, and, uh, and, 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 and there was another pair of the church there. And so we sat and asked, Mom, how are you? I said, I'm fine, so what would you like us to do? Start looking to pray for me. What would you like us to pray for? Oh, you know, I have these demons that have been disturbing me ever since I was a student before I got married. This lady has got, her son is the head of the church, so she's not a young lady. She has had these demons all her life. They come and go. So, Ombo asked her, so do you believe in God? She said, I do. You believe in Jesus? She said, I do. You believe Jesus can save you? She said, I do. Okay, let's meet down and pray. So we gave her some, we told her to kneel on her slippers, because we were praying for a while. So we knelt and we started praying. Um, I think we're supposed to pray in tongues, so one of the elders prayed. Douglas, you know Elder Douglas? Yeah. Douglas Neger, yes? Yeah, sure, he was there. He prayed first, I prayed, and then Wambo prayed. So when, when it was Wambo's turn to pray, and he had told us short prayer, so we had prayed and prayed for like two minutes. As soon as Wambo began praying, the lady started talking like, you know, unintelligible things, you know, just making some very weird noise. And then after some time she started, when we started talking to her initially, she couldn't speak Swahili very well. So one of the elders, the local church, was translating to her what we were telling her in Kigiriyama. She couldn't speak very well. But now in this prayer she starts making the noise, she begins to speak in the I was shocked. She was very bold and you speaking in a bass voice. She told us she is not is Sitoki the what. So at some point we started engaging the demon directly. When I heard that, I knew, aha, uh -huh, this is not her. Who has been in heaven? This is a demon. We prayed there for a long time. And he kept on saying, Yesu, Awezi, Nadanganyo, Yesu, Awezi, Awezi. And eventually, she kept quiet. He asked her, do you believe in, do you believe Jesus can help you? At some point, said, Apana, Apana, Kiamini. So we continued singing, we continued singing, we sang, we sang, and then again we asked, Do you believe Jesus can help you? Then with a very feeble voice, eh, Nami, I believe. We knew the demon had taken up. And so she sat down. So we asked her, So is there anything? Because normally when it happens like that, when the demon doesn't go that easily, it means there's something that she's holding. So we asked her, is there something that we need to know about your life? Is there something you have at home? Anything? Mm -hmm. And so at that time, her sister-in-law came, and she was telling us a bit more about her experience. That oh, in one time she was asked to buy some clothes. The demon gives her instructions. All her children, the demon told her, that child, you will never have this name. And she did. So there's this cloth she has at home. She told her to buy that cloth and keep it there. And so we realized that this is not something we could do in that classroom. We need to go to our home and, and pray there and ask her to 
get rid of all those things that she has been given by the demon. She even has a Quran. And she, we are told that when she opens certain pages of the Quran, the demons come. There is a lot of demon activity in Islam. I want to tell you guys, Islam, keep away. Don't even try this thing about Islamic studies. There is no greater foolishness than that. Islam is the center of demon activity. I saw it with my own eyes. And so we have had to arrange for a time to go to our home, all of us, and then Sister Ingo told us that all our brothers have to be there. That verse, you will dealing with demons is one of your work. You better, are you ready for that? Are you ready to take up the cross? It is not, it, is, it was a very humbling experience for us. I prayed, my knees were paining because we were on the knees and the demon engaged us. It is a no joke. Saving our soul is not a small matter. And you cannot do anything. That is the time I realized how helpless we are. Without me, ye can do nothing. We are engaged not with flesh and blood, but with principalities. It is important that we obey the instructions that Jesus has given us. There are souls out there who are in bondage, who are crying to be delivered. And people are comfortable. They are resting easy. In the last solemn work, few great men will be what? Engaged. engaged. Few. It will not be your conference pastor who will be engaged. It is not your district pastor who will be engaged. It is not the elders of your church who will be engaged. Few great men will be engaged. They are what? Number one, self-sufficient, independent of God, and He cannot use them. The Lord has faithful servants who in the last testing time will be disclosed to view. They are precious ones now hidden who have not bowed the need to bow. Those have been timid, self-destructful, and will declare themselves openly for Christ and His truth. The most weak and hesitating in the church will be as David, willing to do and dare. We have a very serious work ahead of us, and time is not on our side. There is no time to postpone giving yourself and your life to be in the service of God. There is no time to do that. He will raise up from among the common people, men and women, to do his work, even as of the old, he called fishermen to be disciples. There will be soon be an awakening that will surprise many. Those who do not realize the necessity of what is to be done will be passed by, and the heavenly messengers will work with those who are called the common people. You are not ordained. You have not been to a theological school. You are the common people. You are the one that God will work with. Fitting them to carry the truth to many places. You cannot carry the truth to many places when you are stuck in the job in the city. You cannot serve God when you are employed by Babylon. How? How can you do it? If you are employed by Coca-Cola bottlers in Kisi, can you carry the truth to many places? You cannot. You have to pay rent. You have a loan, you have to report to work. You cannot. Now is the time for us to awake and do what we can. So why do we need to go to live out of the cities? Why do we need these meetings? We need to educate. Educate our people. We want to educate you to get out of the cities, into the country where they can obtain a small piece of land and make a home for themselves and their children. When you are out there in the country, you can make a home for yourselves and for your children. A 
again and again the Lord has instructed our people uh, to take their families away from the city into the country where they can raise their own provisions. For in the future the problem of buying and selling will be a very serious one. I won't tell you how serious the problem is. Can you look at that picture? We took that picture yesterday. And we were coming down the narrow road. What are they doing? They are drying. Those guys are walking. Do you know what they are doing? They are spreading maize. Those guys are spreading maize with their shoes. The shoes they came home from. They came from home. And you should have seen those shoes. And they are walking, spreading the maize. That's the maize you use to cook your garden. And before that, we had passed another group exactly like this. And this time they were spreading the beach. With their shoes, their dirty shoes. They go to the toilet with those shoes. They walk in the mud with those shoes. And they walk over the maze that you want to eat. The problem of buying and selling will be a what? They have no heart. When we stopped, they looked at us. Why are those guys taking pictures? They are walking, they are not spreading with their hands. They are, I don't think they are mama and they are old mama. Is this how we used to, to spread maize with those things? With your dirty shoes? Those shoes were dirty, you should have seen them. The shoes they use every day. And you trust the shop. You go and buy maize from the market. You don't know how it was dry. Food for human consumption? And I think that's not enough. You don't know what chemicals were sprayed on that maze. Roundup. How many don't know about Roundup? Roundup is used to clear the things. You don't want to dig today. The problem of buying and selling is not just that you will not be allowed to buy, but it is that you will be buying poison. You have your own country, you have your own garden, 
you can have your food from the garden that you have grown in the way that God has instructed us to grow, then you will be able to preserve the health of your family. And then you can have the strength and energy to go out there for mission and teach others also how to live healthy. Because I can tell you, many of the people out there are dying out of ignorance. They don't know. And we at this have been hiding this truth for years. And so this army of common people who are not ordained, who have not been in theological schools, God is going to use you. I'd like God to use you. Young people, I want you to remember that Creator in the day of Don't wait until you are old. When your energy has been spent with the devil, but that's when you want to give your life in God's service. God wants you when you are fresh. Your mind is clear. <coughs> Alright, second reason why we leave the cities, I'm sure you know the strikes. I think there's another strike going on, eh? or as it's been called a, a teacher strike. Is this still there? There are going to be strikes. Every time, every opening of the school term, this become a tradition that there is what? There's a school strike, isn't it? I can't remember any term that opened and the teachers were not on the strike but especially the third term. So the problem of unions is going to be a serious one. There are, these cities are filled with wickedness of every kind, with strikes and murders and suicide. This was written more than 100 years ago. Satan is often controlling men in their work of destruction. We are now to use all our entrusted capabilities in giving the last warning message to the world. In this work, we are to present our individuality. We are not to unite with sacred societies or with trade unions. We are to stand free in God, looking constantly for Christ for instruction. Through the working of trust and results of labor unions and strikes, the conditions of life in the city are constantly becoming more and more difficult. Serious troubles are before us, and for many families, Removal from the cities will become a what? A necessity. There is, the time is fast coming when controlling power of the labor unions will be very oppressive. And again and again the Lord has instructed that our people are to take their families away from the city into the country. There are terrible disasters that are befalling great cities or to arouse us with the intense activity in giving the warning message to the people in these congested centers of population while we still have an opportunity. The most favorable time for presentation of our message in the city has what? Has passed. For those of you who say, oh, I want to stay in the city because I want to preach to the city. That time has passed. Sin and wickedness are rapidly increasing and now we shall have to redeem the time by laboring the more earnestly. We shall have to redeem the time by laboring the more earnestly. It is easier to go to the country now than next year. It is easier to do it now than next year. The opportunities you have now are better than you will have next year. It will be harder for you next year. You will wish, I wish I had made this decision earlier. There is no benefit whatsoever delay your move from Egypt and Babylon. <clears throat> the time is near when the large cities will be visited by the judgments of God. In a little while these cities will be terribly shaken. No matter how large or how strong their buildings, no matter how many safeguards against fire may have been provided, let God touch these buildings and in a few minutes or a few hours they are in ruins. Oh, that God's people had a sense of impending destructions of thousands of cities, now almost given to idolatry. The time of trouble such as never was is soon to come open upon us and we shall need us, which many are too indolent or lazy to obtain. It is often the case that trouble is greater in anticipation than in reality, but this is not true of the crisis before us. The most vivid presentation cannot reach the magnitude of the ordeal. In other words, we cannot even explain the magnitude of how serious that problem will be. 
But this is not to scare us, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again for fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, where we cry, Abba, Father. God never does anything without warning his children. And he's not warning you to, to scare you, but he's warning you so that you can escape the disasters and the destruction that will come. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Okay? So, why we leave the cities? The secondary reason is what? To do what? Hey, that's a very simple answer. To do what? And so let's go to the primary reason. The primary reason, and this, if you get this, I don't have to continue more. This is the center of my presentation. Anything that I will say tomorrow and day after will be more of a practical nature. But this is the heart of country living. So pay attention. I'd like us to start. Take a deep breath. Read in. Out. Breathe in, hold, out. Okay, let's sit down. We need some oxygen. Let's keep the windows open. The primary reason that we leave the city, the angel that stood at my side and instructed me that few have any conception of the wickedness existing in our world today, and especially the wickedness in the last city. When Satan heard that enmity should exist between himself and the woman and between his seed and her seed, he knew that his work of depraving human nature would be interrupted. I don't know, did I miss something? Okay. He knew that his work of depraving human nature would be what? Interrupted. But that by the some means man would be enabled to resist his power. Yet as the plan of salvation was more fully unfolded, Satan rejoiced with his angels that having caused man's fall, he could bring down the Son of God from his exalted platform. He really wanted to bring down the Son of God. He declared that his plans had thus far been successful upon earth, and when Christ should come, take upon himself human nature, he also might be overcome, and thus the redemption of the fallen race might be prevented. So Satan wants to prevent your redemption. Satan was exalting that he had succeeded in debasing the image of God in humanity. Then Jesus came to restore in man the image of his maker. None but Christ can fashion anew the character that has been ruined by sin. He came to expel the demons that have controlled the will. He came to lift us up from the dust, to reshape the mad character after the pattern of his divine character and to make it beautiful with his own glory. You know today the preaching that is out there is that you can never be perfect. You can never be perfect until Jesus Christ comes. Pastor, what was the name of this pastor? Okay. Alright. Let's, uh, let's, let's continue. The central theme of the Bible, the theme about which every other in the whole book cluster is the redemption plan. The restoration in the human soul of the image of God from the first intimation of hope in the sentence pronounced in Eden to the last glorious promise of revelation, they shall see his face and his name shall be in their forehead, the burdens of every book and every passage of the Bible is what? Is what? Man's uplifting the power of God which giveth us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He who grasps the thought has before him an infinite field of, for study. He has the key that will unlock to him the whole treasure house of God's work. So the burden of every book and every passage is that man's uplift, the redemption plan. That is the burden of the word of God. Every verse that you read there, the purpose is our redemption, our uplifting. Cain and Abel, they represent two classes, the righteous and the wicked, the believers and unbelievers, which should exist from the fall of man to the second coming of Christ. Cain slaying his brother Abel represents the wicked 
who will be envious of the righteous and will hate them because they are better than themselves. They will be jealous of the righteous and will persecute and put them to death because their right doing condemns their sinful cause. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife and conceived and bare Enoch. And he did what? He built a city. Why did he build a city? And call the name of the city after the name of his son. And Noah woke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done. Now see what are the effects of the generations of disobedience. Alright? In Shem, Ham and Japheth, who were to be the founders of the human race, was foreshadowed the character of their posterity. Noah, speaking by divine inspiration, foretold the history of the three great races to spring forth from the fathers of mankind. Tracing the descendants of Ham through the son, rather than the father, he declared, Cast be Canaan. Canaan was the son of Ham. So he's tracing the descendants through Canaan. Cast be Canaan, a servant of Saman, shall he be unto his brethren. The unnatural crime of Ham declared that filial reverence had long been cast from his soul. He no longer had that respect for his parents. That is why he was able to see the nakedness of his father. Okay? And it revealed the impiety and vileness of his character. These evil characteristics were perpetrated in Canaan and his prosperity, whose continual guilt called upon them the judgments of God. As a rule, children inherit dispositions, dispositions and tendencies of their parents and imitate their example so that the sins of the parents are practiced by the children from generation to generation. And thus, violence and irreverence of harm were reproduced in his posterity, bringing a curse upon them for many generations. One sinner destroyed much good. So, Cain was the author of the first city. If you read Genesis chapter 11, the, 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 the people of Babel, they say, let us make us a name. Oh, you've never read that. Genesis, let's go to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. My Bible, I've read it too much, so it doesn't have the first chapters of Genesis. It allow me to use this uh, electronics. I don't like electronics, but uh, I'm trying to Genesis? Yeah, Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. Yeah, verse 4. And they, and they said, Go, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a what? A name. Cities are built to make a name. You remember Cain named the city after his son who? Pride. Pride is what drives a lot of the things that go on in the city. Okay. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalne in the land of Shinar. You know, Nimrod was Nimrod was a grandson of, of Ken. And he dared God to bring a flood. He was angry that God had destroyed the earth by flood. And so he dared God to bring a flood. And he was one of the first people that built cities and called them. And, and Nimrod was the first person to establish a kingdom, a, a state where you are subject to the ruler by virtue of your location. You know, Kenya, when you, by virtue of your location in Kenya, you are subject to the president and the government of Kenya. By virtue of your location. And so Nimrod was the first person to establish a state that so long as you are within his location, then you are subject to him. Before, the leaders in, 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 in the villages were, were leaders that were mostly 
the, 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 the parents or the heads of the tribes and they were respected by virtue of their seniority in age and by virtue of the fact that they were the leaders or the fathers of the, of the tribe. But Nimrod introduced a new kind of leadership of state where you are forced into subjection by virtue of your location. And so the beginning of empires and kingdoms was Nimrod. And so we see that the entire earth is filled with religious ideas that originally started with the Babylonian leaders Nimrod, Tammuz, and Semiramis. In their Nimrod, Tammuz, and Semiramis. And so we can see many of the, of the festivals that we observe today are from this guy, from Christmas, birthdays, sun worship, most of the customs that we have today and most of them we observe in the church are from this guy. December when was he born? December when? 25th. December 25th was celebrated long before the birth of Jesus Christ. Many of us love to celebrate Christmas. How can we check out Christmas for us? It's such a good time. And yes, we are worshipping the son of Nimrod, Tammuz. Here, they decided to build a city and in a tower of stupendous height. I should relate the wonder of the world. These enterprises were designed to prevent the people from scattering abroad in colonies. Remember, God had directed men to disperse throughout the earth, to replenish and subdue it. But these Babel builders determined to keep their community united in one body and to found a monarchy that should eventually embrace the whole earth. Thus, their city would become the metropolis of a universal empire its glory would command the admiration and homage of the world and render the founders illustrious. The magnificent tower reaching to the heavens was intended to stand as a monument of the power and wisdom of its builders, perpetuating their fame for the latest generation. If you've been to Nairobi, we've seen all manner of magnificent buildings. They come in all shapes. They are in all colors. They are most expensive and luxurious, and all of them to exalt the power of their owners and their builders. Everyone they are trying to outmaneuver each other in how splendid their building can be. And we are simply repeating the work of Babel, the Babylonians. The Babel, the Babylon of the land of Shina. So that is your Nairobi. Life in the cities is false and what? It's artificial. It's a vanity, it's a vexation of the spirit. There is not one family in a hundred who will be improved physically, mentally, or spiritually by residing in the city. Faith, hope, love, happiness can far better be gained where? In the Faith, hope, love, happiness can far better be gained in retirement. Anyone looking for faith and happiness? There you go. You know that secular the quotation? Today I had to go to look for the original of this quotation that is in the book Country Living. You know Country Living is just a summary, a very, small, very short summary. So I said, where did this quotation come from? So I went to Roman Street, volume 19, page 335. And so I found there's more to it than that just that statement. Okay? In retired places where there are fields, hills and country. Take your children away from the sights and sounds of the city, away from the rattle and deed of streetcars and teams, and their minds will become more healthy. It will be found easier to bring home to their hearts truth of the word of God. Amen. Faith, hope, love, and happiness is far better to gain where? In retired places. I hope 
that by the end of this presentation you will be convinced to have faith like that of Abraham. Not the faith that intellectually ascends to their idea, but the faith that makes you to go and put your things together and go to the country. Those who will take their families in the country, place them where they are fewer temptations. The children who are with parents that love and fear God and are in every way much better situated to learn of the great teacher. I want us to go back again. The children who are with parents that love and fear God. In the city, the children are not with parents. Did you, did you know that? In the cities, the children are not with parents. Where are they? Where are the children in the city? They are in school. They are with somebody else. Some other dad who has been sent by the teacher service commission. The guys who are leading the strike. Isn't it? The guy who has been sent is the one who spends the time with your child. You didn't give the guy instructions on how to mold the child. You didn't tell him the verses he should read from the child during the school hours. You didn't tell him how to teach your child to pray. How to behave himself. No. But you trust that things will work out in school. So in the city you cannot be with your child. Because you are busy where? At work. And in every way, much better situated to learn of the great teacher who is the source and fountain of wisdom. They have a much more favorable opportunity to gain a fitness for the kingdom of heaven. Oh. They have a much more what? Favorable? Is there hope for the children in the city to get an opportunity to gain the kingdom of heaven? And if that is not the case, would you want to stay there for longer? Would you want to marry a girl who loves to live in the city? Knowing that is the danger of the children. I know you are not married. Would you? Ladies, would you like to meet this young man who works in the city? Who will not leave his job? That's a labored no. Eh? Okay. Aha. Uh -huh. Send the children to schools located in the city where every face of temptation is waiting to attract and demoralize them. And the work of character building is what? Is how many fold? Tenfold harder for both the parents and the children. Few realize the importance of shining so far as possible all associations and friendly to religious life. I want us to stop there. Few shun the importance, few realize the importance of shunning or you know avoiding so far as possible all associations and friendly to religious life. And that includes associations in secular schools. That includes associations in what? In what, my friend? I know why I'm talking to you. Who else is in a secular school? Who else is in a secular school? Let me see. All associations and friendly to what? To, to what, my friend? Religious life. That book, I'll show you the book, but these are not my words, all right? This is the words of the prophet. All associations and friendly to what? When not in school, obtain a strict education. From evil associates, they acquire habits of vice and dissipation. You know what is dissipation? What is dissipation? Having a good time. Going for fun parties where you can enjoy and do all the mad things you want to do so that by the time you are finished from there you 
been watching the movies, you're going to watch football, and all the partying, you have dissipated all your excitement, and you wake up with a hangover. The parents see all this, but it will require a sacrifice. Why will it require a sacrifice? Because you have a job to keep, you have got a status to maintain, you have to pay rent, and you don't have money to get out. Neither can you convince your children to get out. Nor your brothers and your sisters and your pastor and all the elders of the church. It will require sacrifice to convince them that I have to leave. And they stay where they are until Satan gains full control of their children. I have seen children no children. I have grown up with my family. They were very passionate, and I keep repeating this, they were passionate when they were in secondary school. They used to preach. They would preach better than the pastor. They had all the verses in their brain. But as soon as they finished from four, that passion had reduced a little bit. Then they went to university and took a professional course. And they got their degree whether it was in medicine or engineering, and their passion was extinguished. They come to church in jeans. And you wonder what happened. One of them we grew up with him, and the other day he came to church in jeans, he brought his daughter, and he said, Miss Abby, why are you being too serious with the suit? And this is the guy who used to ashamed me in Bible study. What happened? He went to university, he did medicine, he went to the UK, he did his master, he went to Australia. He did all that would appertain to a professional, distinguished degree in a branch of medicine. And you know, the higher you go in the secular education, the colder your spirituality becomes. Until it's frozen. And so he would come to church in jeans. <coughs> the same church we used to go when we were youth with him. He comes in jeans and a face. And he asks me when he sees me in a suit, Bushya, why are you so serious? And I asked him, my friend, because I know he teaches at the university. If you went to see the chancellor on Monday, you have an appointment with the chancellor, and you go dressed like this, and he's crying, he said, he said, no, I did not dress like this. So I think if you're going to see a human, a human leader of an institution properly dressed, how about the creator of the universe? And from that time he stopped asking me and he started changing. He started putting on a suit. But you could see what education had done to this bright star. And I can tell you many, I grew up with personally, I know them, and I'm not saying I'm any better. I just thank God that I was saved as a brand plucked out of fire. The education in the secular system kills your religion. It doesn't matter whether you are a Protestant or an Adventist or a Muslim. By the time you finish your degree, you don't have religion anymore. Because that is what it was designed to do. It will require a sacrifice. And we have had to make sacrifices. When we left the city, it was a sacrifice. And I can tell you, many people have been on their knees praying for us, thinking that we are good work. <laughs> Better sacrifice any and every world consideration than to imperil the precious souls committed to your care. They will be assailed by temptation and should be taught to meet them. But it is your duty, let us read together, it is your duty, duty to cut off every influence, to break up every habit, to send up every tie that keeps you from the most free, open, and hearty committal of yourselves and your family to God. Notice I underline the word committal. 
when you commit yourself to the service of God, when you give your life as a missionary, you must cut off every influence, break every habit, disconnect from every con any, any ties that keeps you from that commitment. Instead of the crowded city, seek some retired situation where your children and yourself will be so far as possible shielded from temptation and there train and educate them for useful. When the children of Israel were gathered up from among the Egyptians, the Lord said, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment, I am the Lord. The blood of, upon the lintel of the door symbolized the blood of Christ, who alone saved the firstborn of the Hebrews from the curse. Any one of the children of the Hebrews who was found in an Egyptian habitation was what? And today, we are not only our children, but ourselves are still in the Egyptian habitation. And the Lord has announced that we need to get out of those Egyptian habitations and put the blood of the sacrifice on the doorposts. Many of us are still buying time in the Egyptian habitation. This experience of the Israelites was written for the instruction of those who should live when? In the last day. Before the overflowing scourge shall come upon the dwellers of the earth, the Lord called upon all who are Israelites indeed to prepare for that event. And to parents he sends the warning cry, gather your children into your own houses, gather them away from those who are disregarding the commandments of God. Who are teaching and practicing what? Evil. Evil. Get out of the large cities as fast as possible. Getting out of the cities is like getting out of the Egyptian habitation. Because the destroying angel is coming tonight. Where will you be? Will you be found in the Egyptian habitation? It's a verse, I think it's in Jeremiah 51. I'd like us to look at the book of Jeremiah 51. There's a similar warning. Verse 6. Verse 5. For Israel, I can see the pages are still turning. Jeremiah 51. Thus says the Lord, Behold, verse 1, I will raise up against Babylon, and against them that dwell in the midst of them that rise up against me at destroying winds. Babylon has risen up against God. And then it goes to verse 5. For Israel had not been forsaken, nor Judah of his God, of the Lord of hosts, Though their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel, flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in our iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. We are being told to flee out of Babylon. Let us flee out of Egypt. And I tell people who are working in the corporate world, you are in Babylon. And we are told to flee out of Babylon. Look at the country heritage of the nobleman. I'd like you to tell me, I know I asked this question last time, who is the first guy? Abraham, the second one? Jacob, and this other one? Joseph, the, the, the other one there? Moses, and this guy? And this one? Huh? Elijah or Elisha? How many say Elijah? How many say Elisha? Uh, okay. 
Yeah, it's Elisha. Okay, so let's look at this nobleman. Read the history of Abraham, Jacob, and Joseph, of Moses, David, and Elisha. Study the lives of men of later times who have most worthily filled positions of trust and responsibility. The man whose influence has been most effective for the world's uplifting. How many of these were reared in the country home? All of them. The men who were most effective, they were reared not in the city, but in the country. The curse of God will surely rest upon unfaithful parents. Not only are they planting thorns which will wound them here, but they must meet their own unfaithfulness when the judgment shall cease. Many children will rise up in judgment and condemn their parents for not restraining them and charge upon them their destruction. The false sympathy, the false sympathy that blind love and blind love of parents causes them to excuse the faults of their children and cast them by without correction. And their children are lost in consequence. And the blood of their souls will rest upon their unfaithful parents. Moses had been learning much that he must and learned. The influence that had surrounded him in Egypt, the love of his foster mother, his own high position as the king's grandson, the dissipation on every hand, the refinement, the subtlety, and the mysticism of a false religion, the splendor of idolatrous worship, the solemn grand of architecture and sculpture, all had left deep impressions upon his developing mind and had molded to some extent his habits and character. When you spend time in the city, when you spend time with those associations that do not fear God, they leave deep impressions in your mind and they affect your character. Time and change of surroundings and communion with God will remove these impressions. And so for those of us who have been in the city for a long time, the only remedy is out in the country. Time and change of surroundings and communion with God. It is when I moved out to the country that I began to appreciate nature. That I began to appreciate that which God has done in nature. That I realized how foolishness man is. How we stamp our chest with knowledge that is but foolishness with God. Man who has never even created a blade of grass boasts of many inventions that are lifeless. We have no idea of the power of God by just observing nature. Shut in by the bulwarks of the mountain, Moses was alone with God. The magnificent temples of Egypt no longer impressed his mind with their superstition and falsehood. In the solemn ground of the everlasting hills, he beheld the majesty of the Most High, and in contrast realized how powerless and insignificant were the gods of Egypt. Everywhere the creator's name was written. Moses seemed to stand in his presence and to be overshadowed by his power. Here his pride and self-sufficiency were what? In the stern simplicity of his wilderness life. In stern simplicity of the wilderness life, the results of the ease and luxury of Egypt disappeared. Moses became patient and reverent and humble. I have been much more patient having been in the country than I was when I was you know, in the country, you will be driving on the road and the guy in front of you stops the car and starts chatting with somebody on the roadside. He stops the middle of the, of the road. And we just sit, and I don't even move. We just sit on the road. He chats and finishes and he continues. And it's normal. There is no problem. That's why you're laughing, because that's not normal in the city, is it? You get out and hold the guy by the shot. What do you think you're stopping in the middle of the road? In the country, you learn. We are still learning. But you can never learn patience in the city. Reverence. 
you learn reverence. When you see the things that God can do for you in the farm, you sit there and watch mangoes produce fruit. And if nothing you do, absolutely, you just watch as the mangoes are maturing and there are so many on the tree and they are so sweet and you did absolutely nothing. It humbles you when I have to go and pick a ripe pie pie and I did nothing. And I come and look at the seeds and how does it do it? You can never appreciate that in the rush and din of the city. When is the last time you ate a pepper? <laughs> you know what I mean? You know? And you're there. God has put that power of germination. It's out there for you. But we love to live a miserable life in Babylon. Babylon will not let her children go. He will not let God's children go. When will we learn do not consider it privation when you are called to leave the cities and move out into the country blessings. Here there are way what? Rich blessings for those who will grasp them. By beholding the sins of nature, the works of the Creator, by studying God's handiwork, imperceptibly you will be changed into the same image. Amen. You know, for the first time I have been observing the stars. The moon. You know, there's nothing so complex as the moon. And as an engineering student who studied quite a bit on the astronomy and all the things of physics, I felt extremely disappointed when I realized that the things I was taught in school were but false. I was told that the moon reflects from the sun. And I sat there for the last two years watching the moon and wanting to see how the moon gets its light from the sun. And I would watch when the moon is, is at halfway, right? And I can see the moon is up there and the sun is here, but the moon is only showing half of itself. And I say, but if the moon is getting its reflection from the sun, why can't I see the whole moon? Why is it still hidden halfway? Why is it still a crescent moon? And I can see both of them in the sky during the day. I said, who is fooling who? We have eyes and we do not see. But you will trust the teacher. And many of you guys are thinking, ah, what did this guy say? <laughs> I only see what I can see in the sky because I was told light travels in a in a straight line. And if you put something in the dark with a torch, you should see the whole object, isn't it? But the moon will be, for, and I will observe it for a whole week. I see it as it getting bigger and bigger, and both of them are in the sky. The sun, and the sun is here, and the moon is here, and the moon is just continuing its normal motions of revealing itself until it's a full moon, and then it goes on and goes on hiding until it disappears. And Genesis says, and God made two great lights. One to rule the day. <laughs> so long as God gives me power to speak to our people, I shall continue to call upon parents to leave the cities and get homes in the country where they can cultivate the soil and learn from the book of nature the lessons of purity and simplicity. The things of nature are what? The Lord's silent, the Lord's silent minister. Given to us to teach us spiritual truth, they speak to us of the love of God and declare the wisdom of the great master artist. Amen. You can never get that from the schools of today. Focus onward and upward towards perfection of character. And we learn in the morning that character building is a work of what? Yes. What foundation are you building character? Is it the quicksand of the life in the city? Or are you going to build your foundation on the rock, Jesus Christ? 
Say the angel, he must reflect the lovely image of Jesus more and more. I saw that we were almost home to rest in the city 1,000 years. The character of the Christian is to be a reproduction of the character of Christ. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. It is my prayer that as we plan to do, to develop our character to perfection, we should build on the rock. And the rock, Jesus Christ, would love us to be out of the city, in the country. That is where we will have time to speak to him. That is where we will be able to learn from nature, which is our second minister, a silent minister. That is where we can raise our own provisions and it will give us the independence to go out and preach. When you live in the city, you don't have independence. You have bills to pay, you have a job to go to, and you have bad food to make you sick. You don't have independence. But when you live in the countryside and raise your own provisions, you can decide today we are going to come meeting in Rongo and we just came with my family. We didn't have to ask permission. We just came. You can't do that when you live in the city. You must apply in triplicate in advance and you can't, you can't there apply all the time. You must seek permission from public. It is my prayer that we shall be a reproduction of the character of Christ. But let us not strive to be like Christ while we are using wrong methods, while we are living in Egypt and in Babylon. You can never reflect the image of Christ in Egypt. You can never reflect the image of Christ in Babylon. And that is why in both places God told his children Israel to come out. Come out, flee for your lives. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us kneel down. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you because you loved us so much that you didn't want any one of us to be lost. And you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to show us how to live a perfect life. You left us an example. You lived as a carpenter. He worked with his father in the countryside. And for the whole of his youth, he worked, he was useful and faithful and obedient to his parents. And Lord, there are many lives of the pastures that you've written down for our mission to live on this last day. And Lord, we may learn that perfect character is to move away from the cities, the hotbeds of vice and sin and violence. That Lord, we can go to retired places where we can listen to your voice speaking to us through your word and through nature. Lord, where we can raise our own provisions and protect our children from evil influences. Lord, before you, our young people, and our old people who have come here to learn about country living. My prayer, Lord, that you might give us the faith of Abraham, the faith of Moses, those people that listened to you and they believed in you and it was counted unto them righteousness. May we have faith to trust you. The Lord, if you have told us to go somewhere, you will provide for our, our sustenance. I pray that you may give them faith and courage to make this choice and this decision. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.